you guys. I'm so happy to have both of you here. This is Ikram. She is a student at the University of Florida, and we'll get to uh, how we met in a second. And Ederson. Um, Ederson, is, well, you grew up in Haiti, but we'll get to that too. Ikram, do you want to explain how we met? Yes. So Taylor and I actually met through Acción Callejera, even though we literally go to the same university. I think mm -hmm. I was there visiting, and you were on a study. Okay. The UF study abroad program and we just happened to run in each other run into each other at Axon Callejera and then we got into it and you said you were from Chicago so I didn't even I was like okay she's from Chicago and then uh -huh. somehow we got into you actually going to UF and I was like wait <laughs> it's interesting how we went to the same university but it was still Axon Callejera that introduced oh. us to each other there it's so cute I had to be me yeah, with me and Taylor, we met um, also at Acción Callejera. Mm -hmm. um, I was there, I think it was probably my first week mm -hmm. being integrated into the team. Like, it was mine too. Throughout the rest of the day, like I was doing my activities and I come back in and I'm like, wait, I think I heard her say something in English. Let me <laughs> say if she responds. Me and thinking then, you only spoke Spanish. <laughs> then you started saying English. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> and then, you know, we start communicating in Spanish, mm -hmm. I introduced myself, whatever, you know, explain I, I was born in Haiti, mm -hmm. but I grew up in the States. I grew up in Connecticut. And then, you know, I came back and went back to Haiti and transferred over here to the DR. And then like my Spanish started getting a little mumble jumbly in, in my head. So I switched to English. Like, I, I do that automatically. And then she just like, her eyes just went wide, like, wait, <laughs> you speak English? <laughs> I just don't remember. I was like, whoa. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I grew up in Connecticut. Like, I have. <laughs> when you told me that, I was like, Connecticut, all right. <laughs> You're here. <laughs> oh, it's so simple. So, yeah, it was a, um, an interesting way to meet, mm -hmm. to say the least. Mm -hmm. But, you know, our time there has been, it's been pretty interesting so far. Yeah. And, okay, so do you want to describe a little bit your background, Ikron? Like, what languages you speak? Um, how you even ended up at Acción Callejera. Like, just give us a little bit of background. Yeah, so I, I was born and raised in Florida, but my parents are Middle Eastern, so from Palestine and Jordan. So I grew up speaking English and Arabic. And when I was in my, the summer of my freshman year, I decided I wanted to study abroad. And honestly, DR happened completely by accident. I was not supposed to go to the Dominican Republic Everybody's like, oh, go to Spain, go to this. And I'm like, I don't like, I'm not a fan of Europe. I'm not trying to do that. And my best friend, she's Dominican. So I was like, okay, let me try this out. It'll be a good time. And from there, I did a service learning internship at, with Acción Callejera. But it was originally supposed to be with another organization called Caritas, which is like very similar uh, mission. And yeah. literally the night before we were supposed to begin our internship, Caritas canceled, and Annie, which is the program director on site in Santiago. Love was, her. Love her, right? She was like, listen, I, I know what I'm going to do, but just don't worry. We're going to get you in a good place. And I, I look back, and I'm like, the effect that Acción Calle had had on my experience in the Dominican Republic, I'm so sorry about the noise, um, was so profound. Like, I can't imagine how it would have been if I didn't end up going to Acción Calle or if I ended up doing my internship with Caritas. Yeah. What about you? Just give us a little bit of background. Uh, okay. Background. Oh, and my, I'm sorry. Ikram also speaks Portuguese very well. So don't say you don't, because I know you do. Ah. I do. He's yeah. a multi there. I have <laughs> my Portuguese on one day. I've just been lazy about attacking it, but I know one of these days I'll have the time to do so, and I will. We'll hold a round table, and we'll have Portuguese <laughs> Honestly, lessons. Yeah. Study session, let's do it. <laughs> So basically, background. Like I said, I was born in Haiti, um, orphaned at a very young age. I didn't mention this in my uh, my own video, but I was orphaned at around the age of three, right around there. Both my parents passed away, and I was raised by an aunt. She took me to the states. That's how I grew up in Connecticut. And from there, I grew up speaking English and Creole, Haitian Creole. And from, let's see, 
by the time I was like 20, I, yeah, around 20, I went back to Haiti and I went out to actually to live. And while I'm in Haiti, I'm like, okay, well, being that I'm here to live, I want to make it like a permanent thing. I was like, okay, I need to find work. What am I going to do? And all of the job interviews, although Haiti is a Haitian speaking country, uh, a Creole speaking country, the like official language, like um, business language and, you know, like the corporate stuff is all done in French. And so I'm going to these job interviews and people are talking to me in French and I'm like, I don't understand what the heck you're saying to me. Imagine. And I'm just winging it. I'm throwing words left and right because Creole and French kind of sound, sound the same. They're similar. Mm -hmm. I like to compare it to Portuguese, uh, Portuguese, <laughs> Portuguese <laughs> and Spanish. <laughs> Portuguese and Spanish mm -hmm. is like the same ratio to what Creole and French is. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like trying to make my Creole sound French. <laughs> did not work for me so i literally put myself in like a study binge i taught myself to speak french with just using i had like three dictionaries i had a full english no four full english dictionary a full french dictionary and then an english into french and then vice versa french into english and then grammar books so i was just writing everything that i i wanted to say in English and then translating it into French and just trying okay. to make the words stick. To make a long story short, I had to teach myself French in order to survive. And um, this is when you moved back to Haiti, right? This is when I moved back to Haiti. Okay. So I had to teach myself French just to get through job interviews and to find work. And was able to work just a little bit while I was in Haiti, then the earthquake hit in 2010. Like messed all of my plans up mess everybody's plans up basically and then i was like okay well this is not it for me anymore i gotta get out of here moved over to the dr and found work at a call center out here i did not know how to speak spanish at all i only understood what people said to me i could not reply back <laughs> i can read it i can write it i can understand it mm -hmm. but i forced myself to speak it by going into the university and having these new presentations I it was a struggle, but I did it. <laughs> so really quickly to give an introduction for everybody um, about what Acción Callejera is. It is an NGO here in Santiago, Dominican Republic, that focuses on offering um, services in order to provide like a dignified life and basic human rights and just a positive environment for children that are living on the streets, um, in street conditions rather can have a positive environment to develop and grow up and not fall victim to, you know, working in the informal economy or, you know, um, a lot of times the human sex trafficking is very um, uh, prevalent here in the Dominican Republic, especially uh, on the beaches. And so, um, I don't know if you guys have some extra information to add about Axiom Cajera. I know last summer when I came for the study abroad, I focused on creating a um, prevention, a prevention workshop on human sex trafficking. Like our group that came for the study abroad, each of us had a topic that we had to make a prevention workshop on for Axiom Callejera. Um, some of them were like uh, how to prevent um, getting dengue, which was a lot like mosquito nets and just um, like, you know, precautionary measures and uh, preventative measures. And another one was recycling because here in the Dominican Republic, they have a really big problem with trash. Um, and they don't really have like a established recycling system. So that's a little bit of like what I had done in Axiom Callejera, but do you guys have any other, like what their mission is or anything to add on that? Um, and a lot, like I, um, Peter Sinardi mentioned, a majority of the population is Haitian, um, at least in like the main center where um, Ikarom and Peterson are working. Um, and do you know, like, have they told you how they got here? Like, have they told you, like, their stories? I haven't gotten, um, to get a lot of background stories yet. Okay. Um, so like I said, I literally, um, uh, started working with Action Cajera this year. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the background stories, you know, since they're, um, vulnerable children, 
some of those questions that would lead to getting to know more, yeah, you know, deeper information is, is sensitive. So I don't want to like force them into like thinking like, okay, why is he asking me this? Mm -hmm. Is he trying to, you know, get this information mm -hmm. to put me out there, you know, mm -hmm. put me on blast or something. Yeah. So I've been going with the soft approach. But um, I'm sure that a lot of them came here either with a parent or a tutor or a guardian, um, not in the best of ways, and which basically has left them out in the streets doing whatever necessary in order to survive. So that is one of the things that Action Callejera is trying to do. They've been trying to get these children to um, register them into school, to start them on the education path. Mm -hmm. In that sense, once they're um, accustomed to an institution like school, then they'll be able to start looking for better work instead of the street work that they're doing. Yeah. And from there, then they can fully integrate into society and be uh, contributing factor yeah. to the society that they're in and that was part of the um introduction actually that they gave me when i first started volunteering was that like you know it's basically trying to help reform some of these children because right now like surviving on the streets they basically is live or die it's a do or die mindset so mm -hmm. it's trying to reform that mindset into understanding that there are other ways and better ways to mm -hmm. do things and surviving is not a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And another thing really quick to add is that in Acción Callejera to enter in and to actually receive like food, for example, like during lunchtime, um, the kids have to bring, I think it's like 25 pesos or something like that, just to get them a bit of like having to be, uh, it's, yeah, it's so really five cheap, to 15 pesos. Just to get them in the habit of like having some sort of responsibility, like they don't get everything for free. And so I think that's a really smart strategy because you know you worry about if you give out free handouts, they start taking advantage. So I think that is an intelligent, brilliant strategy that they had brought and incorporated into the institution. But what about you, um, Ikram? Do you have anything else to add as far as the mission goes or what you've learned? Um, I think everything you said was pretty on point about what Acción Callejera does. I know they also do community-based work with Santiago. I don't want to say rural communities, but not in the downtown area where we used to work last yeah. year during my spring break i accompanied a a group called drop they're from they come from fgcu amazing group they come every year so attached to the children like they're almost famous in acción callejera mm -hmm. and we completed a project in one of the communities called hato del jaque and mm -hmm. basically they made like a sustainable playground out of like tires and pcd wow. tires things like that yeah. those little centers that are in like the periphery of Santiago some of them are just homework calls so it's mm -hmm. just to keep kids who usually aren't in school or need help with school to keep them to give them that opportunity to have tutoring but That's also why I then, yeah some of them provide social medical psychiatric services like I forget the name of one of the places, but it was where Joan used to work a lot. I don't know if you remember him. He was a Spaniard that lived in DR for like 10 something years. And but he was La Inguita del Pastor. That's where I was. Maybe, I, I, have, I have no idea what the name is, but I know they have a big building and mm -hmm. there's like a dentist who sometimes comes, obviously funding and resources aren't very consistent, but like that is something that Acción tries to offer to the communities yeah, yeah. no i i uh, it's amazing how they don't just focus on like the educational side like they actually do like i love the psychologists there like they're great and like you were saying they're very careful about you know asking straight up questions because that can really like sometimes be intimidating or confusing to the kids yeah, so exactly shut them down exactly so they know what they're doing so how has the spanish language allowed you to achieve um, your goals or what you had intended to do with Axiom Callejera? So when I started at Axiom Callejera, I, like Ederson, Ederson, correct? 
I understood relatively well, but speaking it was a struggle. Um, honestly, Acción Callejera was what made me have goals in speaking Spanish because my, whatever I struggled with the first time that I was there, no matter how much I struggled, I still benefited from the experience. And I was like, okay, if this is how well I'm receiving this experience, with like an intermediate level of Spanish, I can only imagine how much I'm going to connect with these children and with this work environment if I actually learn it. So from then and there, it was like, the fact that Axion helped me learn Spanish so much because Dominican Republic in general doesn't speak a very easy dialect of Spanish, but thankfully I had made those connections with Acción. So even when I came back to the United States, I was able to like use those people to help me practice, to expand and. It's like a linguistic networking, I guess you oh. could say. Yeah, but it's an <laughs> intentional one at that. Like you don't even consider that being the reason, but it ends up helping you in so many different ways than you ever thought. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. What about you? Um, with me, Spanish has helped me with my duties at at least to connect with the coordinators. Mm -hmm. um, being that there, these, the coordinators that I work with, there's only one person that speaks Creole, and he's the, um, the psychologist that comes in. Yeah. Yeah, I remember him. I would say. No, not him. Oh the, oh, the other, yeah, I forget his name. Yeah, I forget. I'm blinking on his name right now. <laughs> his name is Dasni. Yeah, Dasni. Yeah. So, um, Dasni is the only one that speaks Creole. And everyone else speaks Spanish. So I had to be able to speak Spanish in order to, you know, understand what our plan was for the day, what activities we were going to do with the kids. Although a lot of the kids that come in are of Haitian descent, that's where my Creole came into play, being that I was there daily, and Dasni is only there on uh, one day a week. So mm -hmm. I to help a lot more with the Creole part, but um, the Spanish helped me with the coordinating. Mm -hmm. And like the direct work with the kids was done in Creole. Yeah. Well, um, from my point of view. Mm -hmm. So here's like a fun question. Um, do you guys, I know you've started recently, but do you remember, do you recall your first day working at Axiom Callejera, how it was, like how it felt to just like jump in and use a language that, you know, you don't really use often? Do you remember that day? Yeah. Um, so at that point, when I started Axiom Callejera, at that point I had already been in DR for like a month maybe, okay. and I was studying at Pucamaima. And so thankfully I felt a little bit more comfortable, but you know, going from the university where you're very well known as a foreigner versus a work environment. I was so nervous. <laughs> I was so nervous, but I had my friend with me. So it was both of us. And we also knew it was such a last minute arrangement. So we were very just anxious about the, the whole experience. But ever since we sat, when we got there, they were in a meeting. So we sat through the meeting and I'm just sitting there like, wow, these are a lot of big words <laughs> coming back and forth. I really have no idea what's going on. Um, I met someone, his name is Robinson. I know yeah. you know who Robinson is. Um, ever since, once I met Robinson, everything was fine after that. He showed us a tour. He's, he was a very, he was very connected with the kids. The kids were very connected with him. He had a lot of influence in Acción Callejera. So when we would ask him questions, it was always like very welcoming, very welcoming. Um, the kids were so... I miss them so much. They're just, they look at you and they're just like, it doesn't matter that you can't communicate with them 100% because at the end of the day, a lot of them don't even speak Spanish. Most of them speak Creole in very little Spanish. So we're sitting there trying to communicate and it was like something that we worked on throughout the entire trip. But I will never forget how easy it was to communicate with people that I didn't even speak their language, which is just mind blowing to me, beautiful. I remember um, my first day, they literally brought me, one of the directors that works with ISA, um, ISA, 
she went in the concho with me and we took two and we got to the center and she just left me. She was like, okay, so this is your classroom. This is your teacher. And there you go. Como que suerte. And I was like, okay. So I walk in and this is my first time like actually working abroad. And so I walk in and at that point, you just have to literally leave everything aside. Just leave everything, every fear, everything, and just get integrated because you know what? You're there for a reason. You're there for the kids and you just have to show that, you know, you're strong and you're in there to make like long lasting relationships and, you know, trustworthy relationships. So you kind of have to, you know, act as that strong mentor. And I was so proud of myself that I did that. I literally just got right in there and started singing some songs, clapping around. They were all looking at me like, what in the world is going on right now? It looked at me as if I was an extraterrestre. And I was like, you know what? No, I'm here. I, I'm normal, you know, and I, I will forever remember that day because it was literally, she just dropped me off. And I was like, okay, like everyone's staring at me. I'm like, what do I do? And you just got to integrate. You got to make it normal. So yeah, there's no other option. They don't let you do anything. <laughs> you are here. You are going to be here. You're going to be present. <laughs> but yeah, that's lovely, lovely six weeks. So yeah, I don't, I definitely, definitely will forever remember that trip. That was definitely a, a remarkable life changing trip as far as career wise, personal, like personally, you know, talking about personal growth and uh, yeah, it was great. So what about you? My first day there, um, it was similar to Ikram's. I um, was sitting in on a meeting that they were doing, basically mm -hmm. like coordinating what the action was for that day, um, what the agenda was for the day. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there like, I don't know anything about missions work. I don't know anything about none of this. <laughs> like I'm brand new to the field. I'm in school for civil engineering. And so, you know, like social work and all of that is brand new to me, but it's something I feel that I have a passion for being that, like you were saying, personal growth and like how it's helped, like self-reflecting. Mm -hmm. I was one of those kids, one, like, you know, in the past, not so much in a vulnerable state, but I didn't have much guidance growing up. Like everything was done just off of my own, like improv. And so being there has actually helped me work on the kid, on the inner kid that I have that needed that nourishing, that needed that like sense of guidance. And now I'm being like that person of mentor for someone else. And so it's, you know, it's like a mirror effect. Mm -hmm. it's, I'm helping them at the same time they're helping me. Yeah. <laughs> How That's good. Thinking, yeah. How have you guys personally grown, you know, throughout your years learning different languages? How, how do you think? Versus if you didn't learn, for example. Wow. I don't even know. I, this sounds so cliche. I don't even know who I would be if I didn't speak um, languages because which <laughs> each region of the world that I focused on you I learned more about myself I learned more about the region that's that's the reason why I went back to DR so many times is because I was like I don't want to just go to this place yes I learned the language but that's not that's not the true reason why I wanted to learn the language I wanted to learn the language so that I can connect with this place and I want to continue connecting with this area so the same thing with Portuguese like it wasn't just Portuguese and I talked about this in my video my individual video it wasn't just Portuguese, it was Brazil you know it was like Brazilian culture and what I want to do with with Brazil and what I want to learn about Brazil and the same thing with Arabic like I'm now studying formal Arabic in my in at the university and I can't do that unless I in in for me my own experience I can't do that unless I kind of revisit these parts of myself that I never gave much attention to and that in turn makes me more passionate about the language. It makes me actually want to learn the language and it makes me able to use the language in a way that's appropriate in many different situations. For sure. Yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah, with me, um, I guess if I were to put it like on a scale, how it's helped me, like the littlest things in movies nowadays, there's Spanish, um, and like I watched maybe four movies during the past two weeks and it was Spanish in all of them 
before knowing Spanish, I would have just seen those scenes, like, what the heck did they just say? <laughs> <laughs> like, wait, what's going on? I missed the part of it. Like, that, like, you have a hole that's there now in the film that now is being filled in because I know these languages. And even with French, like, sometimes I sit at home and I'm watching series that are in full French, and I'm like, I would have never done this if I was still in the States. If I didn't put crazy to learn these languages, like, I would have never done these things. Like, it would not have made me more outgoing as I am. Um, it's definitely opened a lot of doors, not in the sense of just opportunity, but, you know, that language barrier people talk about, like, that barrier that is, real. is non-existent now because yeah. I know these languages and I understand yeah. them. Yeah. No, but that language barrier is real. Like, if, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and I think another important point, not to cut you off, but really quick, um, is knowing different languages also puts, puts you in a really good position to understand the historical context of our world and how it is affected where we are now in the world. So it almost gives us an advantage to how we can perceive the future and continue to, you know, want to develop the future. Like, for example, you know, when I came here last year during the summer, we learned about Dominican-Haitian relations and the history between the two. And now it helps me to understand, and that class was in Spanish, and that helps me to understand the effect, how impact, not impactful, but how negatively the naturalization law that was passed in, or that was, you know, 2010 naturalization law here in the Dominican has negatively affected children of Haitian migrants. And so I think, you know, not only does language help you with present day, but it helps you understand better what happened in the past and how we can fix it in the future. And not only do you get that in like history classes in the United States, but you get that abroad as well. And so I think that has been a really, really big impact on my career, especially in like development work, um, understanding historical context in order to continue, so. Yeah. Okay, but. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. Um, and besides that, like, it has definitely opened up more connection with other individuals. Yeah. Because, you know, how would I have ever been able to do this volunteer work if I didn't know Spanish. Mm -hmm. Like I would have never put myself out there like that. The topic of my full roundtable discussion is pathway to global citizenship. So how would you guys define yourself or how do you how do you perceive yourself as a global citizen? Through language. You just need to answer that one first if you like. What was that? Oh okay. you just need to answer that one first if you like. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I'm thinking on that one. I guess through my experiences, my global citizenship comes more in the sense of the cultures. Mm -hmm. The various cultures that I've, like you said, immersed myself mm -hmm. into and that I've gained from. Um, because getting myself out of that bubble in the States, I was around the same thing every day, all day. And although I grew up in the Haitian family, that was just at home, like mm -hmm. that was within itself. Mm -hmm. And actually being in the country and seeing things firsthand, experiencing them for myself. And I'm that type of person where I learn firsthand. Like I need to touch and feel and see and smell and taste. Mm -hmm. And it opens up your senses to a lot of different things, like the realities. Different realities, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that you would have never gotten anywhere else so that has helped me when I got to Haiti out here and wherever else in the world I may end up mm -hmm. I feel that that ability to adapt to the culture and to the surroundings mm -hmm. is what helps me be a global citizen I love that what about you Ikram? um I I really like what you said about the Haitian culture being at home but then once you go to Haiti, it kind of puts you in a different place. Um, I feel like being a global citizen comes in my in my own life. It comes from not seeing your own experience as the only experience. So I was born and raised in America. That has affected a lot of how I see the world. Even though my parents are Palestinian and Jordanian, even though I relate a lot to that culture, it wasn't until we went to Jordan and we actually lived there for like a year when I was in elementary school. And that to me showed me this very different type of lifestyle that 
if I were to have, if I would have just stayed in America, I really feel like without that experience, I would have probably looked down upon it. And it really like, it humbles me as an American because in America at the end of the day, this is a great country, love it to death. We are very privileged. So that tends to translate poorly when it comes to talking about international experiences. Yes. So I think entering the world with very little expectations, because at the end of the day, we're all biased. We can't completely remove it, but trying your best to remove it to the best of your ability, I think is what really makes you a global citizen, what really makes you eager and willing to learn about the world around you and kind of continue to keep it in your life. Yeah. God, those are like really like chilling responses. <laughs> and no, cause I love that. Cause you guys have had, you know, like I am American, like I grew up in an English speaking household and everything. So I don't have that, you know, like background per se, like outside of the US. So it's so great knowing that like you guys can connect on that. And so I love seeing, even though you don't know each other, like look at that, like you have, you know, somewhat of a similar experience. That's great. Um, all right, so I wanna, you know, obviously this is for a language conference. So I thought we can speak a little bit of Spanish. Okay. Yo siempre estoy contando los días para regresar. Extraño mucho a los niños y a, a todos los empleados que trabajan ahí. Yo estoy luchando aquí para mantener mi español fuerte porque ahora yo, estoy, yo tengo una, una clase de español en la universidad solamente para practicar, para, sabes, seguir hablando. Claro. La mayoría de mis estudios ahora porque yo estoy haciendo un internship en Brasil, tú sabes, virtual. Como Virtual, sí. Entonces, la mayoría del tiempo yo hablo portugués. Y ahora cuando, cuando es mi tiempo para hablar español, eh, no es que es difícil, pero yo siempre tengo que como ver pelis, escuchar música en español, cualquier cosa, para que se quede conmigo el español y no, tú sabes, no mezcla con el portugués, porque son idiomas muy parecidos, muy, muy parecidos. Cuéntanos de lo que tú estás haciendo allá en Brasil. ¿Qué tú haces con el internship? Entonces, yo hice un programa en el verano de idioma y cultura brasileña. Claro que fue también virtual, pero yo conocí una, una directora de una organización ahí que se llama Catalytic Communities. Ok. Entonces, es una ONG, ONG que trabaja con las favelas de Río. Wow. Y como hace reporting y es un es un orga, una organización muy grande. Hace uh -huh. mucho. Yo lo que yo hago yo hago tradiciones de, uh -huh. de las de las los textos de Rio on Watch que es un news source. Disculpa, ahora estamos en Spanglish. Ah, uh, está bien. O sea, la... sí, ellos no tienen te... su propia news newspaper que uh -huh. solamente hace reporting de las favelas para que la gente tenga una perspectiva de las favelas para las favelas y entonces yo traduzco para esa organización y también yo trabajo con las comunidades porque ellos tienen una red uh -huh. de, se llama la red de la favela sustentable estoy okay. tratando de traducir y me encanta, me encanta la verdad, me encanta la gente. Yo nunca he ido a, a Brasil porque cuando yo empecé mis estudios, yo empecé estudiando portugués en enero. Ah, y solamente me quedé como tres meses. Sí, con la full. Ay, Dios. Entonces yo no he tenido esa oportunidad de irme a Brasil, pero Ajá. ya tengo tantas conexiones con Brasil porque yo hice ese programa. Eh, el programa y también el internship ahora, ya yo estoy lista para ir. <ríe> Solamente para ver, para experimentar, ¿sabes? No, o sea, literalmente yo estoy pensando en hacer un, una pasantía, un internship en Montevideo, Uruguay, durante la, el año que viene. Entonces quizás que podamos viajar juntas allá. Ay, Dios mío, no me digas, no vamos. <ríe> 
No, 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 vamos. Yo te no. llevo a Uruguay y yo me voy para Brasil. No se preocupe. Quiero aprender portugués, obviamente, porque me encantaría trabajar mm. en las tiendas. Entonces, estoy poco a poco aprendiendo portugués informalmente, o sea, por eh, como que aplicaciones. Entonces, vamos a ver cómo me va, pero me encantaría. O sea, a entonces? Porque yo conozco no. a Nino. Yo sé que tú conoces a Nino también. Ah, ah sí, ella habla lo va. Ella y yo estamos en una clase juntas. Ah, vale. Sí. Qué... sí. Hey, qué fino. Bueno, pues yo creo que se acabaron las preguntas, mi gente. Eh, bueno, si ustedes tienen como que últimas palabras, eh, reflexiones, lo que sea, ahora es tu tiempo. Eh, es para la gente que está aprendiendo español, portugués, lo que sea. Eh, no sé, si ustedes tienen algo más que decir. Mm. En español, en sí. inglés. Yeah. Muchas gracias por la oportunidad. Me encantó sí. hablar de mi experiencia. Porque yo amo, yo amo Acción Callejera y lo extraño. Entonces fue muy bueno hablar de esa parte de mi memoria que va a ser realidad de nuevo. Solo usted. Sí. Y, no, con... y nada, si alguien... Yo siempre digo, si yo, no, si yo no hubiera aprendido el español, mi vida no haría así. Entonces... Si alguien tiene una oportunidad de aprender una, un idioma, no importa la edad, en verdad no importa, hazlo, porque abre puertas que nunca vas, nunca puedes imaginar. Claro. Si tú tienes la, y si tú tienes la oportunidad de hacer un study abroad, te los recomiendo todo, todo, todo mi corazón. O sea, por favor, hazte un favor. O sea, si es posible. Si no es posible, bueno, eh, o sea, hay como que en el internet, hay como que oportunidades por, en tu comunidad. Eh, hay, bueno, ahora hay oportunidades virtuales, Virtual, más que nada. Entonces, eh, si ustedes quieren como que sugerencias, recomendaciones, por favor, pónganse en contacto con nosotros, porque tenemos contacto, hemos, no sé, hemos hecho mucho networking, entonces tenemos contacto por todo el mundo. Lo que necesiten. <risa> Solamente en América Latina, eh, entonces, nada, como que tú tengas algo, ¿no? Sí, para mí, lo único que puedo decir es que ese miedo que mucha gente tiene de aprender un idioma, de cometer errores, uh -huh. ese miedo es lo peor que puede tener. Exacto. Lo que yo siempre digo a una persona que está tratando de aprender un idioma nuevo es, cometen todos los errores, porque uh -huh. es de los errores que se aprende. Exacto, y tú sabes. Sin errores, tú no aprendes. Exacto, y te cambia también, porque si tú estás como, si tú tienes ganas, si tú estás willing de cometer errores, tú eres más, no como, o sea, no quiere decir como que humilde, sino, pero tú tienes más como que ganas de, de enfrentar los miedos de tu vida. Y no solamente Eso. los que tienen que ver con los idiomas, sino los demás en tu vida. Entonces, los idiomas te enseñan un montón de cosas, no solamente las palabras, pero sino de la vida. Entonces, por favor, hazte un favor. Sí, o sea, y aprende, aprende del mundo, aprende lo que está pasando fuera de los Estados Unidos, especialmente en los Estados Unidos. Hay más en ese mundo, hay más. Te lo sal, sal de círculo, sal de tu zona de confort, 100%. Bueno, mi gente, muchísimas gracias por participar. Los aprecio un montón, o sea, literalmente. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias por tenernos. Y, sí, o sea, un gusto. Y bueno, vamos a vernos en la conferencia entonces. En la conferencia, sí. Bueno, cuídense. Igualmente, Igual. un beso desde Santiago. Sí, Santiago. Gracias. <risa> Chao.